Scorpion SSK S80 subbrief. All right, our story begins way back in the 17th century, 1631. Uh, the French built a city and a shipyard of Cherbourg up in the northern coast of France. Uh, the company that now runs the shipyard is now known as Naval Group, but it's had many names over the previous almost 400 years. They Naval Group hires or employs over 13,000 people in 18 different countries, including France. Naval Group is a state-owned enterprise, which means the majority shareholder is the state of France. Uh, they also have incorporated and absorbed a number of well-known uh, defense manufacturers like Thales, DCNS, DCN, DCAN, all of those now have been absorbed and are partial shareholders of Naval Group France, um, just known as Naval Group. So uh, they built or designed this submarine, um, the Scorpion, with uh, four variants in mind. And they ended up actually getting about six out of it, which is part of why this is so difficult. Uh, the main variant is the CM2000 diesel electric submarine. It's a standard submarine with a diesel motor that produces electricity that turns an electric motor that turns the screw. That's why it's diesel electric. Almost every submarine we talk about today is going to be that one. But they did offer variants of this for anybody who wanted to buy one of these subs. The first variant, uh, the one they pushed the most, was the Air Independent AM2000 with the MESMA motor. But nobody, not a single country as of 2020, has taken them up on that. They also have a downsized Coastal Patrol CA2000, uh, which is a slightly lighter one that has less endurance, but pretty capable. Uh, only displaces about 1,200 tons, so significantly smaller than the normal CM2000. Uh, Brazil said that they would uh, buy four of these if they also included the plans for the Scorpion, the ship's plans. That's the detailed piping tabs. So they could try and put a nuclear reactor in this, and we'll get to that. Uh, and then Spain, one of the two countries that builds the submarine uh, for export sales, uh, decided that they wanted to make their own version of it that it was eventually designated S80 Alpha. And uh, that's a story onto its own that we'll get to soon. And in 2007, they did introduce a smaller design than the coastal 1,200 ton design, a, a nearly a just under 900 ton, 19 man small submarine that still had six torpedo tubes, but only had an endurance of about 10 days, which makes it about, you know, it's just effective for defending a point, whether it's the Straits of Gibraltar or a harbor, you know, it doesn't have a lot of range. Uh, so nobody has bought that either. But as of 2007, uh, the SM Experimental 23 is available for purchase as well. All right. So we've kind of hinted at this. The trouble development of the S-80 Scorpion project begins in the 1980s when France realizes that, hey, you know, it's time to replace their aging submarine fleet. They're running two diesel submarines at this time in the, in the 80s, the S-60 Daphne and the S-70 Augusta. And uh, while the Augustas are doing fine, the Daphnes are going to be retired. So they're going to be really replacing these S-60s with these S-80s. But budget cuts suspend S-80 development in favor of improving the S-70 Augusta to what's known as the S-90 Bravo Augusta Bravo, which will go into production. So now we're going to have France making two submarines at the same time eventually. The S-90, which will be a different subbrief, and the S-80 with Spain. 1993, Spain gets involved. They bring their checkbook and they say, hey, we want to restart this program of S-80 because Spain has an aging fleet as well. And with the combined shipyard facilities Spain has and France has and the money uh, that they can make from selling these to other countries, they can afford to purchase four of these submarines for themselves, for Spain. Well, France agrees to this and they reopen the suspended S-80 project. The agreement is, is that Spain will be allowed to purchase four, uh, but they will modify them to meet Spain's needs. This modification will have great consequences, but essentially they're making the submarine bigger by about 20%, up to 2,300 tons and have a length of about 20 or 71 meters versus the 62 meters. So significantly extending the length 
and the weight of the submarine to meet Spain's needs. With those agreements in place, they move forward. The next year, 1994, Thailand comes in with a request for information with the intent to purchase four Scorpion submarines. But in 1996, after they received their information, uh, they cancel their first order. And every couple of years thereafter, 1998, 2000, 2003, they eventually cancel all four orders. This is done for political reasons, for events that are happening in Thailand at the time, including budget cuts and government reorganization. They basically can't afford the submarines that they want. These are expensive submarines for diesel boats. April 1998, Chile orders two Scorpions, Scorpions at CM2000s, which are the normal diesel electric boats. So they do have one order on the board in 1998. They're moving forward with that. All right, so the Chilean orders. Uh, Naval Group Charlesburg Shipyard will produce 60% of the Chile's boats. That's broken down into man hours. Each boat takes how you know however many thousands of man hours. France will get 60% of those man hours paid. Spain will get 40%. Um, Spain Naval Group's company will be responsible for the pressure hull for both submarines. And France will assemble the first one. Spain will assemble the second one, equally dividing the assembly cost. Uh, on October 1998, a Spanish judge, this is the same year the order's made, by the way, about six months later, a Spanish judge uh, Judge Balsar Garzon orders the extradition of a former Chilean president, Augusto Pinochet, for crimes against humanity. Now, President Augusto, at this time in October 1998, he is on medical leave in the United Kingdom, getting some medical procedures done. Spain sees this as an opportunity to extradite him to Spain for these crimes that are alleged to have happened while he was president of Chile years ago. So Chile obviously doesn't like this. Uh, they don't like their ex-presidents being extradited while they're out and about. So they try to cancel the order. You know, the order has just been placed. They're like, hey, let's back out of it. France, you build us the two submarines. We don't want Spain involved in any of this. But because the, uh, there was financial cost and penalties involved in moving the production from any shipyard to another after the agreement was signed. And they ended up not extraditing the president, the former president of Chile uh, for crimes against humanity. Uh, they let him return to Chile, um, supposedly in poor health, but uh, in almost Dr. Evil style, as soon as he got off the plane in Chile to a crowd of supporters, he got up out of his wheelchair and gave victory signals like he had fooled everybody because he did. Uh, President Augusto is not a good individual. He was the pioneer of tossing people out of helicopters long before they did that in the Philippines. Uh, he, uh, he killed a lot of people and he is guilty of torture. And that's what they were trying to get him on. And uh, he got away and uh, returned to Chile and was never extradited. Malaysia. Well, Malaysia wants a couple submarines too. So they placed an order in 2002 for two of the diesel electric subs. Uh, 2009, France and Spain produce one each uh, and in the same year. So they get two submarines in 2009. But there are some di technical difficulties during sea trials, which delays the delivery to the following year. Uh, one of them had to do with the cooling systems weren't cooling properly, which is a big deal because one, obviously qu equipment overheats, breaks down, stops working, and that could have cascading consequences, including sinking the sub. Uh, as a matter of fact, Naval Group, um, when asked about this, they were they, their response was, the submarine can dive, but it's not recommended. And whenever the people building your submarine say, hey, not recommended that you dive this boat, you don't dive the boat, you get it fixed. So they took uh, an extra six months, got all the problems worked out and delivered the boats to Malaysia with relatively uh, no, no other delays other than that. Malaysia didn't want to make any changes to the boat. Uh, they got what they ordered in a, in a timely fashion. All right, India's Project 75. India is much more broader thinking and forward looking whenever it comes to this project. Uh, in July 2001, 
France and India sign a technology transfer agreement to license construction of the Scorpion CM2000 in India. Uh, this is a big deal, these transfers of technology, because they're essentially bringing countries that are in a development state as, you know, set by the United Nations. They decide who's in development and who is not. And it brings them up onto an equal technological level as the uh, beneficiary or the, the country providing the technology, in this case, France. And so in order to do these, there has to be a technology transfer agreement. This has more to do with weapons than other technologies. And because we're talking about submarines, that's where this technology transfer agreement comes into effect. We're effectively making the Indian Navy much more capable with this weapons platform. Therefore, the whole world has to know that this is not done under the table. And now India will have this capability of the submarine. So they have this technology transfer agreement signed, ready to go. Uh, in 2003, India, still negotiating, insists on constructing all of the initial six submarines in their Bombay shipyard. Initially, France wanted to build two with Spain, you know, and then the four follow on for a total of six would then be built in India. India was like, no, we have a new policy. We want everybody, you know, we want all these to be indigenous, built by us with our materials, with our technicians. Uh, so our shipyard workers get the experience and uh, we're self-sufficient. You know, you just provide technical assistance and we're going to do the work. And these negotiations continue until 2005 when France finally concedes that they're not going to get any money for this uh, technology transfer agreement. Uh, and this contract will not happen unless they agree to these terms. So they finally do. All six will be built in India. So it's a little bit of a victory for them. A uh, big boost to the Indian economy, especially these workers that have not much, uh, but are given a job and are learning a trade building submarines now. So the Scorpion CM2000 will replace India's old Foxtrot diesel boats. The old Foxtrots are literally falling apart from rust and, you know, use and age. And uh, there's no dry dock refuel and overhaul procedure that's going to get any significant life out of them. They, they must be replaced. And India has gone full on with this Project 75 as they intend, they've announced their intention of building an additional 18 subs over the next 25 years of this, of this model. All right. Okay, Scorpion by the numbers. We've been talking about Scorpion. Let's talk about what she looks like. Uh, she is only 62 meters long. So that's about average for a diesel boat. Uh, and 6.2 meters beam. I thought this was kind of interesting uh, that these lengths and widths would uh, use the same digits. So they're easy to remember. So 62 meters long, 6.2 meters beam. Just remember six and two and you'll always have those memorized. Uh, she has a test depth of 300 meters. She does use the equivalent of HY-80, which is the same still used in uh, the 688 American submarines. So um, that test depth is pretty accurate, pretty close anyway. Uh, she has 20 knots submerged, and she does use a seven-bladed screw blade. There were some photos floating around of a five-bladed screw, which might have been used at some point. But now these, once they're operational, they all have seven-bladed skewed screws. Um, the CM2000 diesel generators produce 2,500 kilowatts of power uh, and displace 1,700 tons. The uh, air independent propulsion mod is 200 tons heavier and 27 feet longer. And if you look at the model, looking at the picture there, you can see how the air independent propulsion module would literally just plug into the engine room, uh, making it 27 feet longer there. So just add that to the submarine. And there you go. The submarine with the air independent propulsion maintains its diesel engines. It still has those. So it's going to have AIP and diesel engines. All right. They all have six torpedo tubes. They're all 21 inch or 53 centimeters. They can carry 18 53 centimeter stows, weapons, uh, which is torpedoes or exoset missiles. Uh, they have a very capable reconnaissance radar, the AR-90, 900 rather, uh, with ESM and direction finding. So they can raise the ESM antenna, get a direction on a hostile radar or any radar, and uh, have an idea of where that person is. One of the big improvements here for 
um, countries like Chile and Malaysia and India is the Subtix Combat Management System. This is a really capable, integrated, uh, you know, I'll say fire control system, but it does so much more than that, that we're going to go into it uh, in detail. And the crew was 31 people. That's uh, 24 or five crew members, 25 crew members and six officers. So they have three rotations of eight enlisted men operating the submarine with uh, one or two officers, you know, on watch at the same time rotating around. All right, here it is, Subtex Combat Management System. This thing is a gem, and it is great that this is being made available to navies that don't necessarily have first world budgets like uh, the United States and the Royal Navy, because uh, this is very capable. What it does is it's an integrated network of computers that are all off the shelf. Like you go to Amazon and buy these servers if you want it to and these flat screens and these trackballs and put them all together into the system, which makes it very cheap, uh, inexpensive, I should say. It's very well done. So let's start with communications up there in the top left. It has two antennas. So one's a satellite antenna and one's what we call a multifunction mass or an MFD. And uh, they can, um, MFA, and they can communicate with local group, uh, whether it's a helicopter or another surface group or even another submarine that's in radio communication and share target information. This is so important that if one of their arrays, whether it's radar, sonar or whatever, has a contact, they can share that data via a tactical data link. Now, this is a great capability. This is the force multiplier. This is why you go around the oceans in fleets, ships working together, even submarines. Uh, so instead of being independent by itself, not having any data other than what it can hear, it can get all of the data from all the sensors in the cooperative group that's on the same tactical net. Huge capability. Okay, below that is the navigation. She pretty much has everything you would expect a modern naval vessel would have. Inertial navigation, very important for a submarine because you're not always on the surface. And that just dead reckons your position by motion over time. Uh, Doppler and EM log, um, that is how you measure speed through the water versus speed over ground. On a submarine, those are not always the same speed because you have currents, underwater currents pushing you around. So you need something like that to have a more accurate fix on where you actually are. Uh, they have a bottom sounder, of course, GPS and AIS. A multi-beam echo sounder is good for uh, very high resolution positioning of the bottom of where you are using, let's say, um, you know, a topographical place like a peak or a ridge. And you can see exactly where that ridge is from you. And you can use a, a high resolution chart to compare, contrast that to and find your position relative to the position of uh, whatever it is you're echo sounding. It's very good stuff. That technology has been around for a while. But now that we're sharing it with everybody, I think that's, uh, that's good for them. Let's see, over the water detection systems, we've got two periscopes, a search periscope and attack periscope. That's standard for just about any submarine at this point. Uh, and then an ESM mast and navigation radar, uh, all with ESM on top, except for the radar, of course. Uh, over on the right, we have the torpedo room, which we have our 18 stows, our six torpedo tubes. Uh, they can lay mines, they can shoot torpedoes, and the Exocet missile. Now the Spanish uh, version, the custom one that Spain is making, they can shoot the Tomahawk missile because they have the fire control software to talk to the Tomahawk. So that's one of the special things about that one. And then finally, the sonar arrays there on the bottom right. This is a towed array capable submarine. They can um, take in, draw out a tactical towed array that's the equivalent of a TB-16 in the American Navy. Uh, and so they have good low frequency detection um, and it's, it just makes them even more capable. A lot of diesel boats in the past, you know, haven't always had total capability just because they haven't had the space or the power to, to power such a thing. But now that we're getting on in technology and each one of these systems is using a little bit less space and less power, they can have things like tow arrays now, which are very capable. It gives them very long range detection, along with a flank array, distributive arrays, intercept arrays, the Syndrolic Array is the major sonar uh, broadband display. That's the one you see in all the movies with the traces coming down. That's what the Syndrolic Array is. The distributed arrays are very interesting. It's kind of a new technology along sonar, much newer than towed arrays. And a distributed array is you have arrays around your submarine on the outside. 
you got some at the bow, you got some at the stern, you got one in the sail, sometimes one at the bottom, near, near, near the keel. And these arrays are not physically connected to each other, right? But they're sending information into the combat management system. And in the software, they digitally stitch the data together so it appears as if it's one long array. It's called distributed array. It's a really good technology. Um, the nice thing about that is, is you can get really low frequency detection, which is the equivalent of long range detection in most environments without a huge array that takes up your entire submarine. Anyway, all this data, everything we've talked about from communication to sonar to loading the torpedoes and navigating and driving the submarine and raising and lowering the periscopes is all brought together in the combat management system. And that's basically the command center where you have these six consoles and a couple laptops and a tactical table that displays you know, a composite of all detections, all contacts available, whether it's from other platforms radioing you the data or your own array giving you uh, solutions can be combined onto one tactical table for the captain to look at and see the entire picture from a top-down perspective. It is a great um, way to see a very complex picture or a very complex environment and understand it quickly, giving him the ability to make good tactical decisions. So this is a, a great combat uh, management system. I'm so glad that they're getting this. And uh, not a lot of submarines have something this capable, but the modern submarines are getting systems like this. All right, the Black Shark Heavy Torpedo. Uh, this might be one of the most advanced torpedoes in the world. And they're getting it whenever they um, buy these, uh, the, the, these submarines. They're getting access to order these as well. This, uh, this torpedo does a few things that I'm surprised are unclassified. For instance, long range search active. This is new. This is not something that I remember when I was in the Navy. Apparently, the submarine can ping at a frequency that's below 10 kilohertz. So it's like the ping you hear in the Navy, or in the movies rather, whenever you're watching the movie and the ship's going around here, ping, pong, ping, pong. Yeah, it can do that. Okay, the reason why you would want your torpedo to do that is because those lower frequencies can travel a lot farther than the higher frequencies at the same power level. So you get a much farther sonar search, active sonar search with your torpedo. I feel like I should not be telling you this, but this is this, this is all public knowledge now. Uh, so once it finds its target, it shifts to the high fidelity interrogation, discrimination and termination sonar, which is the best title ever, which can go, it's in a range, and I'm not gonna tell you the number, but the range is from 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz. So somewhere in there, there's a frequency that they use to uh, interrogate your target. Uh, <laughs> spatial filtering is uh, used for target bearing and depth accuracy. I, I posted a picture here at the bottom of what spatial filtering looks like to the torpedo. So it gets an active return and it has all these energy levels return basically right in front of it, right? But the torpedo doesn't know if it's on the right depth, doesn't need to steer up or steer down. So with spatial filtering or yeah, spatial filtering, it can kind of condense that return into a more accurate 3D picture and put itself on the right depth to strike the target. It's really good stuff. Frequency filtering does exactly what it says. Frequency filters out some bad frequencies. The reason why you wanna do that is there's a lot of jamming that goes on out there that a lot of decoys and jammers and maskers that are used to defend against torpedo attack have specific frequencies. You could filter those out, you not even see them. You know, people could be chucking countermeasures left and right, your torpedo doesn't even see them because it filters them out, it's great. Uh, the false detection processing is uh, along lines with uh, masking and getting around those countermeasures. Uh, demodulated noise and classification target propulsion. There's no way that this isn't classified. All right, I'm gonna tell you about this, but you can't tell anybody else, all right? Your torpedo can classify the screw blade of the target before it hits it. That's what that means. Why would you wanna do that? Well, let's say that you know you're going against a submarine that has a seven bladed screw. One of the terminal homing um, gates you can put on it says, hey, make sure this thing has a seven bladed screw before you destroy it. Because maybe you're working with other submarines from other nations that have six bladed screws and you don't wanna kill them. So you, this could be used as a target discrimination uh, and classification method. This technology is super, the fact that this is automated is next level. And then they put it in a torpedo. 
I'd love to see what they put in their sonar system. That must be awesome. Okay, echo elongation, spatial and angular analysis for 3D mapping of target block. Kind of already went over that with spatial filtering. It's not the same as spatial filtering, but it's very close. And it gives the uh, weapon a 3D image of the environment it's in. And so it can see right where it needs to go and destroy the target. Black shock torpedo, you don't want to be on the wrong end of one of these guys. This is a badass weapon. Okay, SM-39 Exocet anti-ship missile. The Exocet's been around for ages. Uh, anybody that's a Navy buff knows about the Exocet, but the SM-39 is the submarine variant of the Exocet. It's a subsonic missile. Uh, it has a range of about 100 miles, uh, you know, going downhill. It is a sea skimming with a solid rocket propellant that um, burns initially, and then the turbojet sustainer kicks in after that. You can kind of see that happening in the photos I've uh, supplied for you here. It has 165 kilogram warheads, about 360 pounds. It's enough to do the job. Uh, the idea of the Exocet isn't to straight up sink a ship as much as it is to shred uh, parts of the ship as it enters and set it on fire. Um, so like a lot of uh, ships, even warships, have this asbestos lining uh, and the idea is to shred that lining, making it less effective and setting everything else that is possibly flammable on fire and then let, letting fire do the work. Uh, the Exocet missile, you know, it does have a good sized warhead, but it's essentially going to burn your ship down anyway. And then uh, see, it's launched from a canister that rises to the surface. There is a little sensor on the nose of that canister. First of all, the canister is very buoyant. Let's start there. You eject the canister from your submarine. You're normally at periscope depth whenever you do this, but you can be a little bit deeper. That canister doesn't hang around. It goes right to the surface right away because it's extremely positively buoyant. And then the sensor on the nose of the canister, or the top I'll call it, the moment it senses that it's dry and it senses it pretty quick, it triggers the rocket motor on the other end of the canister to push it out of the water, just as you see here. And then from there it ejects the missile whenever it's in the air, the fins deploy. And then you have an Exocet flying at the target. Very good design. Exocet's been around for ages. Okay, so the Spanish ambitious disaster. Remember the Spaniards wanted to make four of these submarines for themselves. That was part of the deal. They came in with a checkbook when France didn't have the money. France was moving on to building the S-90 Bravo. And they were going to just put the S-80 on hold for a while. Spain comes in. This says, hey, let's... Let's build this S-80 together. Let's sell some of these, make some money. And with the money, we're going to build four for Spain. Good plan. I mean, that sounds like a reasonable line of thought. But here's what happened. In November 2003, Spain submits an order for four S-80 submarines. Uh, this unique build is only used by Spain, so they're not going to sell their personal build to anybody else. So they don't need a technology transfer agreement with anybody. It is going to fire the uh, NATO Tomahawk missile. It can fire the American ADCAP as well. It does displace 2,340 tons. So it's significantly heavier than the uh, CM2000. And this is key. It's 71 meters long. And nobody bothers to check why this is important. But on paper, in their design bureau, 71 meters looks just great to put all the new equipment in. The original cost of $500 million estimated in 2003 has ballooned over a billion dollars because of these changes. So a lot of this equipment, real expensive. And that's per submarine, over a billion dollars per submarine for a diesel boat. Like we're paying that for a nuke boat in America, but they want that for a diesel boat. Anyway, in 2013, this is 10 years later, produ production is suspended when they discover that the 71 meter sub doesn't fit in any of the Spaniards dry docks, they can't build the thing because they don't have the facilities to put the submarine in at its full length. So they suspend the project altogether. They're like, well, I guess we got to build a new dry dock. Yeah, I guess you do. You got probably should have checked that part before you decided to go forward with this. The new AIP technology developed in Spain uses bioethanol fuel cells uh, instead of the uh, MESMA. AIP that France is offering. So to compound their error, they're not using an, in, an air independent propulsion that's already available and offered to them as part of the deal that they're a part of because they're one part of two building these. They decide to go their own way and build bioethanol fuel cells uh, instead. These fuel cells will be built by UTC power and the bioethanol reactor will be built by a Benegua, which is I've looked into these companies and I, I'm skeptical as to how much support they're going to get out of them. They don't appear to be very big companies. 
Um, but hey, maybe even small companies can provide big things too. We will see. We don't know yet because even though we're over 20 years or about 20 years since the agreement, uh, no, it's more than that. Yeah, it's like 30. Anyway, it's a long time Spain's, Spain's been in this agreement. They haven't got a single submarine out of it yet. They haven't even started building their first submarine as of this recording. They're scheduled to build hull one, laid the keel in 2022. So I can see this being a follow-up. Uh, sometime after that date to see how far that they've come. But they've spent a lot of time and money building submarines for other countries, but they can't build one for themselves. All right, the Chilean Navy, uh, they got their two submarines. They're home ported out of the Teleco Chile. You have the O'Higgins, which was the first one delivered. So you could call this the O'Higgins class, but they don't. Everyone calls it Scorpion class, except the Indians. They have a different name for it. And the uh, Carrera, Carrera was the second one. Uh, delivered about a year apart. Something interesting that happened to them in the last couple of years is there was a major earthquake uh, while one of these, we don't know which one, one of these was in dry dock at the time of the earthquake. Now the earthquake did do damage to the facilities on the shipyard, but more so the tsunami that followed the earthquake a little while later absolutely flooded out and destroyed a lot of facilities and damaged these submarines that were sitting in dry dock. Because a lot of them had, you know, hatches open, hull cuts made, and all this water came in and flooded out part of the submarine and did things that we're not even sure about because they haven't been very open about what happened to their boat. But it is likely that at least one, if not both of these, are no longer operational because of that uh, tsunami. All right, the Malaysian Navy. Uh, remember, they got theirs pretty much on time with uh, a small hiccup because they didn't make any changes to the design. They basically signed an agreement to get two submarines and they got them. So there they are, home ported out of Spinagar, Borneo, part of Malaysia. And uh, you can see the Razak there as he's being rolled out, getting ready to get its paint job on. Out of all the countries so far, I'd say Malaysia has made out the best. They've, 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 they've made the best deal. They got the most for their money. And uh, both these submarines are operational right now. All right, the Indian Navy. So the Indian Navy, you know, Project 75, uh, they got big plans, big dreams, those Indians. They initially, you know, bought a contract to build six there in India. Uh, they've built three so far, the Kalvari, and they call this the Kalvari class. Uh, and they're allowed to do that because they've, um, they've completely built this in-house. So this is, this is literally an Indian submarine. So if you ever see a reference to the Calvary class, know that they're talking about the Scorpion S80 French design. Uh, the second hull was the Kandari, and the most recent completed one is uh, the Carange. You have a picture of all three of them there. They are building three more. Um, they just haven't finished them yet. All right, so India's Defense Research Development Organization, or DRDO, Air Independent System. Uh, like other countries, like Spain, um, they're going to build their own air independent drive. They're not interested in France's Mesma AIP. They want to build their own. And they went with uh, the phosphoric acid fuel cell. It uses all phosphoric acid as an electrolyte. That's the, if you know batteries, that's the liquid. That's the medium between the athode and the cathode, anode and the cathode, uh, that allows electricity to be made. You know, the flow of electrons goes through the electrolyte. Well, the electrolyte in these energy cells is phosphoric acid, obviously very corrosive, dangerous to handle, uh, but it's got some uh, plus, uh, positives as well. The first is it can be used with almost any kind of hydrocarbon fuel like methanol and ethanol. So they can pull into almost any port in the world and get refueled because whether it's diesel fuel or a methanol or a natural gas, uh, they can just refuel from that and continue about their business. So it gives them a lot of flexibility in both operations and, um, and, and, and range. It, they can actually go farther as long as they have places to pull in, friendly ports to pull in and buy these, these fuels. Let's see, the PAFC generates about 200 Celsius in heat. So really hot. That's kind of a downside you would think, but because this is a heat generator, you can use that heat to create things like steam uh, and maybe power something else in the submarine, an auxiliary system that requires steam. Uh, maybe um, in the galley, instead of using electricity to heat up that steam kettle, you use heat from a heat exchanger that's attached to the PAFC. 
So uh, just because this creates a lot of heat uh, doesn't mean you have to throw the heat overboard. You can use the heat in other systems. Uh, the PAFC uh, has been commercially available for years. Yeah, phosphoric acid fuel cells were one of the first fuel cells to be publicly available. So this technology uh, in, in fuel cell technology is one of the oldest. It's been around. So what India did, they didn't really develop this themselves. They took off the shelf energy cells, bought them, and then repurposed them to fit inside their submarines. All right, so with these fuel cells, they can run continuously submerged for 25 days which is pretty good for a diesel boat. You know, some of the other, the German boats, they can do uh, 21 days. The Gotland class, I think, says 21 days. So they're, they're all in line with each other, 21, 25 days with these energy cells. And they're very quiet when they use them because the energy cells don't have any moving parts. The only moving parts as far as propulsion goes when they're on their energy cells is the shaft and the screw blade. That's it. Very quiet. So right now, only hulls five and six are planned to be fitted with uh, these energy cells during construction. Now, they can go back to the first four hulls and retrofit them whenever they go through their overhaul period. Whether or not they do that, we don't know. We'll see what they do. Again, we're looking into the future here. They've only built the first three. They don't even have hull four finished yet. So who knows what they're going to do with hull five and six. But they've expressed an intent to install this AIP in hulls five and six. We will see. All right, so the Brazilian Navy, this is interesting. Uh, they ordered four submarines and they wanted the plans to build a nuclear submarine. So uh, they got two of them already, uh, the Richelieu and the Humanita, uh, both uh, delivered now. Uh, I guess one is still being assembled. These are all being assembled in Brazil, by the way. So uh, Brazil negotiated that into their contact on contract just like India did. Uh, but they're only going to build four of them. What they really wanted, what Brazil really wants is a nuclear powered submarine because they looked at what happened to Argentina in the Falkland Island War after 1982 and was like, hey, uh, looks like uh, nuclear submarines might be the future of naval warfare. Maybe we should get some of those. And they have been trying to get that since the 1980s, but through different um, political and elective uh, changes they've made in their leadership, of course, budget cuts and crises. Um, they had an economic crash, just like many countries do. Uh, they, they just couldn't get around to affording to have or even having the political desire to have a nuclear submarine until now. So along with the four submarines that they ordered that are diesel electric, they also have the plans and the permission from France to attempt to build a nuclear submarine with it. So in 1984, I kind of already went over this uh, because... Uh, they began looking into building a nuclear submarine. I'm going to skip past this because we've already went over it once. In 1990, budget cuts uh, and a move towards a more progressive government because they had elections. They actually had like a military coup in 1985. If you want to look up the history of Brazil, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Anyway, basically from the 80s, 90s into the 2000s, they didn't have the will or the money to buy a nuclear submarine. But in 2008, Brazilian President Lula from back then, created a new program called Program for Development of Submarines, or ProSub. And he ordered the four submarines from France, uh, and he wanted the ship plans, not the ship. They weren't going to deliver any goods, but the ship drawings, the piping tabs, if you will, of the Scorpion submarine, with the intent of installing an indigenous Brazilian nuclear reactor and propulsion system on it. At no point was France ever going to agree to share nuclear propulsion with Brazil. That was never part of the negotiations, and it would have been a deal breaker had they brought that up. But Brazil is one of the few countries out there that has the full cycle of uranium within their country. They can dig it out of the ground, they can process it, and uh, they can enrich it as much as they want to. Uh, they could even create weapons-grade uranium if they wanted to, or plutonium. But they choose not to. Matter of fact, in 2017, they sponsored a treaty to the United Nations to ban nuclear weapons globally. And they're one of the sponsors of that bill. So obviously they don't have any intentions of building that. So they've been a good steward of their own, you know, nuclear material. Now, they've had nuclear power plants in Brazil for years. So now what they want to do is they want to make a nuclear power plant that will fit inside a the hull of a scorpion submarine and move it through the water. Essentially an air independent version of, of the scorpion submarine using nuclear reactor instead of, you know, phosphoric acid. It's a different type of, uh, of, of, of heat source. 
So um, in 2016, uh, the agreement does not include nuclear propulsion, as we stated. The research facility in Empero, Sao Paulo State, which I have marked there on the map for you, that is the technology center that is uh, not military. So they're like a state school or something. Um, they built the technology to build this reactor. Okay, it's very important that they point out that this is not a, a military program. It is simply a, a peacetime use of nuclear power to push a vessel through the water. Now, this is a huge con point of contention with a lot of countries, you know, including the United States, uh, saying that, hey, this is using nuclear power for a military use because a submarine is a military weapon. And Brazil is arguing, no, the military weapons are your nuclear missiles with the nuclear warheads. The nuclear submarine is simply a weapons platform. And it's getting down to this debate of whether a weapon and a weapons platform is the same thing when they're both using nuclear energy. It's a huge debate. It's still undecided, but they're going forward with building this nuclear submarine right now at the time of this recording in 2020. So in uh, April 2018, a couple years ago, former President Lula, he's no longer in office. He created the ProSub program back in 2018. He gets arrested and pleads guilty for bribery and corruption for accepting money for contract approvals to this nuclear program. So the guy who created the program gets out of office and begins lining his pockets with lots of money in a bribery scandal that is the largest in world history, according to the United States Department of Justice, exceeding 12 countries or involving 12 countries in, in this man. Now, again, America is not exactly on board with him uh, building this. And so it's likely he was set up, but he pled guilty. He definitely took the bribe. Uh, so he is guilty of that, if nothing else. But he's no longer the president. And even though he's arrested, the program continues. May 2019, ProSub is moving forward. Uh, Brazil is contracting a nuclear submarine uh, based on the Scorpion ship plans with a nuclear power plant and propulsion designed in Brazil. So they are moving forward with this. Uh, the ship is not operational yet, uh, but if it gets operational, we're definitely going to do a piece on it because I find this very interesting. And uh, I really think this Brazilian president was set up, but it didn't stop. Even though they arrested him, it didn't stop the program. All right. So final thoughts on the Scorpion. One, it's a very capable modern diesel electric submarine. Let's just get that out. For all the problems we talked about today in development and changing air independent propulsions, and, and nobody liking France's version of AIP and all that. It's, it's still a great submarine because it has a good combat information center and an outstanding weapons uh, magazine. Whether it's the Exocet or that Black Shark torpedo, you don't want to get in a fight with one of these. Okay, uh, It is comparable to the Chinese Type 039 Alpha, which is the On class. We haven't done a subbrief on that one yet. We're going to have to get to that eventually. Um, most of the delays we talked about today were self-inflicted. Remember, Malaysia didn't have any delays other than uh, a small sea trial hiccup that delayed them like six months. Uh, but everybody else had huge delays, uh, mostly because they couldn't agree on terms of the contract, transfers of technology, whether or not they wanted air independent drive or not, or they were going to develop their own air independent drive. So don't hold the delays against the uh, against France and Spain. Um, like the reason why Spain doesn't have their submarines even right now is purely because they tried to change the design after the design was finished. Now about the Mesma, the problem with the Mesma as good as it is, as, as quiet and, you know, I love it. It's only 25, approximately 25% efficient. Um, so it loses a lot of energy between the fuel cells, uh, the, the hydrogen, uh, the ethanol that powers it, and the, and the pure oxygen that comes into it, and the actual torque that gets put to the shaft is only about 25% of the actual energy going into it. So it's very inefficient. I was surprised to learn this because it looks like a beautiful engineering marvel, but apparently they need to work on its efficiency and get it better. Energy cells, on the other hand, uh, which is what every other AIP is except for the Stirling engine, um, is up to 70% efficiency. And that's, you can make that even better if you, you reuse the heat that it generates, you know, with another, you know, heat, heat exchanger powering something else in the submarine. So energy cells are the more technical and difficult to use and install and maintain. But if you can achieve that, you get a lot more for your money in space in the submarine. 
All right, the Subtix integrated command system is an exceptional intelligence gathering platform. We kind of already went over that. But in a peacetime world, when you're not shooting torpedoes at targets, you're collecting information. And really, Subtix does this really well. So they can send their torpedoes out, torpedoes, they can send their submarines out into the world, stay off the coast of a busy harbor or shoreline, and just observe what other countries are doing. This is really important right now in the South China Sea with all the stuff that's happening there with China trying to enforce their economic you know, boundary and extend that into the South China Sea. If you want to see what they're doing clandestinely, you can send up one of these submarines and keep an eye on them. And then finally, uh, the Black Shark Torpedo makes this platform a very real threat. I don't think I need to repeat that again. Uh, Black Shark Torpedo is quickly becoming one of my favorites. All right, so thank you very much uh, for everybody for supporting these uh, sub briefs. These are a lot of fun to do. I really do appreciate them.